Okay, everybody, welcome. Look, this is uh, John Haller from Fellowship Bible Chapel in Sunbury, Ohio. I have with me uh, some of my friends, Bridget, uh, Bridgelette, Tom Hughes. Um, hang on a second here. My phone keeps playing at me. Tom Hughes, Scott Townsend, Bridgelette. And we're going to, I thought it would be a good idea if we could get together in a little bit larger group than we usually do and just sort of talk about some things related to the end time. So this is the first one that we're gonna try to do. Uh, I have a couple others that are scheduled to be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna try to go for just two hours tonight. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this, I've talked to Tom about this a number of times, is when I go to these conferences, I really learn a lot when I speak at a conference. And mainly it's because I'm in the back in the green room talking to the other speakers off topic. And that's very enlightening many times. So what I would like these to do is sort of be like the green room experience brought to you guys on uh, YouTube Live. So uh, we're going to talk about technology tonight. Very hot topic. A lot of things going on. I know Britt and Scott both talk about a lot, as does Tom, and as, as do I. So Tom is going to moderate for us and tell us when it's time for us to stop talking and ask us some questions. So uh, Tom Hughes from Hope For Our Times, take, us, uh, take it away. Thank you, John. This is going to be a great time, everybody. And I'm going to kick this off with a, a portion of a news article. Britt, I've shared this with you before. You probably, uh, in fact, you wrote about these things way back then, too. This is from 2018, and this will help set the pace and the direction that we're going. But this was by Matt Ward. Uh, in 2018, this is the, the mind-boggling thing. I know all of you guys will get this, but he wrote an article called The Technological Tipping Point, and he wrote this. I've written before about our increasing proximity to the tribulation period. Amazing change is going to occur within just the next half decade. Uh, we are now reaching a point in human history where almost everything we do, our habits, our preferences, our biases down to our associates, families, the properties we live in, all records about us anywhere and everywhere are going to be amalgamated, centralized, and kept forever. Then he said, collectively, we are creating every day more than 2.5 quintillion bytes of new data. That amount is set to rise exponentially over the next decade. So again, this goes all the way back to 2018 when he wrote this. And he continued, mass data technology means that we, are, we can never escape from what we have written, posted, emailed, what we have bought, and from where our loans, debts, and paychecks, what we have messaged or WhatsApp, every single piece of data that exists out there on us can and will soon be brought to bear against us. There's nowhere to hide. The governments of this world won't have to arrest you and bring you in for detailed questioning if you concern them because the information about you will already be right there, stored and ready for analysis. It will tell them more then they would ever need to know about your motivations, your loves, your loyalties, and ultimately how they can or cannot trust you or whether you pose a threat to them. I've said it before that the technology revealed in Revelation is the technology of now. It is not technology of circa 2040. The tribulation isn't going to be in 20 years' time. The tribulation is going to be soon, really soon. We are about to reach a technological tipping point one that nobody on this earth is going to be able to escape from. Uh, but I, you guys are all friends, and I read, I, I, I keep going back to that article. 2018, six years old, that article is. You guys talk about this all the time. I've asked you questions about these things, and I'm thankful to just be a part of it, be able to ask you questions. So let's just roll um, because there are some real big concerns. So we have some questions that I was able to write up based on how smart you guys are. So you guys ready? Sure. Yep. Yes, we okay. are. Okay, so Gosh. here's the deal, everybody. Each one of them gets three minutes. <laughs> if they want to go longer, they have to say, please, may I please have one more minute? So so that, so that we're, I got these guys like to talk. You guys all know that. So this is going to be fun. All right, number one, first question out of the gate. What and who are the Magnificent Seven? And uh, and Scott, I'm going to start with you. And uh, what do you see coming because of their power? Well, the uh, Magnificent Seven refers to seven of the most powerful companies uh, on the planet right now. And I just had that list here a second ago. It includes 
uh, Britt, do you recall the players on that? Yeah, so you got Tesla. Microsoft, Amazon, <laughs> Tesla, Google, Amazon, called Alphabet yeah. now. Yeah. Um, Meta. 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 NVIDIA. NVIDIA. Yeah. NVIDIA. And what was uh, special about that list, obviously, and they're having record uh, profits right now, and they're rolling in their reporting on Wall Street right now. So it's very visible what they're doing. But all of these invested very heavily in infrastructure. I just think of the you know billions and billions of dollars of investment that these are capable of doing. And before the the program began, John mentioned that uh, you know these companies have amassed a massive kind of like a wallet full of cash and they're spending that cash right now in acquisitions for the technology pieces that they do not yet completely control. And that's a frightening thing. It's it's good for the entrepreneurs and investors that are in those companies, but it is a bad sign that there's further tech consolidation because as we all know, uh, these are the companies that are the tech oligarchies and uh, they're highly controlled by, you know, let's say unfavorable, you know, resources to the uh, uh, Christian worldview, biblical worldview. So that's who they are and why it's important. Okay. Uh, Britt, what are your thoughts on, on that? And, and I'm going to throw, take it a step further. You see this mass amounts of power, mass amounts of money at a time that the tech giants are also having mass layoffs. Um, which we'll get to that in a little bit too. But I look at the 10 Kings of uh, Revelation chapter seven, also Daniel two, Daniel chapter seven. Do you see something like this uh, developing into the 10 Kings? Now this is just the magnificent seven, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that ultimately the technologies that they're working on are gonna be controlled and the concern that we should have and that control is coming from states because states still control the police power. And ultimately they're working with these companies to create the very things that you mm. opened talking about in that article you were reading. But I take a little bit of a different take on this. When I think of the Magnificent Seven, I think of how much of the stock market is dependent on those seven companies. <laughs> now many people wow. have piled into them and there was something back in the early 1970s called the Nifty 50. And they were the 50 blue chip stocks that everybody had to own. And now we had this magnificent seven. And you look at the rest of the market, when you look at the S&P 500, well, those seven companies account for most, all of the gain the last few years. And so if you start to see earnings go down in these companies, or you see a sell-off, it's going to cause a stock market crash because there's not a breadth across a number of companies as we've had in the past. That's not indicative of a strong market. It's indicative of a sick market. That's what we saw in the 1970s when the Nifty 50 failed. We had essentially a crash back then. Most people don't think of the 1970s as a stock market crash, but the beginning of the decade to the end, it declined about 36% in the S&P 500. But when you think of the inflation we had in the 70s, that the cost of house went up, doubled, the cost of food doubled, cost of a barrel of oil went up eightfold, you really had a crash akin to 1929 in many ways in terms of your purchasing power if you're invested in the stock market. So I think this all plays into coming crash we're going to see and the technologies that these companies are going to help the governments roll out in order to drive people into central bank digital currencies. I almost, I, Excellent. I, I'm, I almost see this as a, I, I do personally believe that there is some logic that says that these guys play a role in handing the keys to the antichrist at some point. These are the, the without, without these companies and, a, and especially, uh, you know, the tech companies, Microsoft and Apple and others, NVIDIA, OpenAI, the, the manifestation of, you know, godlike powers to the Antichrist can't be done. And I think that, uh, as I try to imagine it, you know, I'm not sure that they're all the, and I think the context of this is the 10 kings, right? And I think some of those are probably uh, quasi- you know, governmental agencies already, they're already actors, global actors, 
be able to do things that regulatory wise, the other uh, governments cannot do yet. So I think they play a very critical role in anything that these guys do, such as, and I'm sure we'll get to this later, but uh, Sam Altman and OpenAI investing massively in chips and infrastructure right now is another example of how pervasive that power base is right now. Well, uh, would it be safe to also say that uh, the government has, uh, the, the military, excuse me, has its hands in, in these organizations. DARPA's known to be uh, in the development of Google and Facebook from everything that I read. And yeah, right. when I look at it from that angle, in a sense, you could say the tech <laughs> companies are, are they, they operate in a way that can be used as uh, like a military arm against the people which I think is what the concern is. Uh, if I'm wrong, you just step in here and say, you don't know what you're talking about. But uh, but if if no, you're I, not going to say that, I'm just going to move on to John and ask John, well, that, what are your yeah, thoughts? Well, well, Tom, you know, these these companies are very large. The, the C, Where the Magnificent Seven came from was a CNBC article that was came out the other day. And Deutsche Bank and other analysts were saying that if these seven com companies – that we mentioned combined, they would be the second largest stock exchange in the world just on their own. They have tremendous cash. Uh, I was listening to an investment advice thing yesterday on AI and technology, and Microsoft and Apple have well in excess of $300 billion of cash on hand. That gives them the ability to do a lot of things with that. So when we talk about this in terms of end times Bible prophecy, though, we're always talking about what, what's this final big beast empire and the conglomeration of 10 kings and, you know, a little horn rises up and takes over three. And what's the timing of that? And then we also have, and I see we always have some questions about this end times Babylon. What is that? Where is that? which I think is still an open question. Everybody's got their favorite uh, thing they want to pound on with, with their, their little hammer. But I don't think we know that yet. But I think, I, in fact, I just saw a video with J.B. Hicks and Amando Gonzalez on Prophecy Watchers or J.B. Hicks's channel. I don't remember where it was. Might be on both of them, for that matter. And they were talking about it. And I think Mondo has done a lot of work on thinking through is are some of these tech companies one of these 10 kings that arise up at the end because they're so controlling they're so big and the numbers are enormous if you had invested ten thousand dollars in nvidia uh seven or eight years ago you would be a billionaire today if you hadn't sold your stock so and they just announced record profits today and they're and you know they were a game chip you know they they were for gaming and graphics for video graphics, but they saw what was coming with AI. So the companies are big; they're very controlling, and I just think they're going to grow in importance. And so then when we kind of port that over to this end times Babylon beast empire, and we know that this Babylon is destroyed, the question becomes: I think the critical question in identifying. Babylon is when is it destroyed in this last period of human history? I think that's a that's an important question to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to come back to that in just a few more minutes. Um, but I'm, if you I'm have curious. That much time, Tom. Pardon me. <laughs> Time's getting short. I mean, you know, <laughs> if we have that much time, I, I would I would like to come back to it because it's going to play in here in a few more minutes. When we get further down sure. this too with Babylon, but. Uh, you guys had all mentioned AGI. Uh, what, what, uh, Brith, what, what is AGI? Well, it's called, uh, stands for artificial general intelligence. And basically, it's this idea that computers will be able to mimic the human brain. And so, the, the goal of artificial intelligence in many cases what many people are working toward is to create that artificial general intelligence and back so in 2000 next step. yeah so back back in 2006 i believe it was ray kurzweil who's an inventor he works at google he's a technology forecaster 
He predicted that by the year 2029, $1,000 worth of computing power would be equal to the human brain. And if that's true, and you think about what John just said of these companies sitting on $300 billion in cash, they could essentially employ 300 million, the equivalent of 300 million human beings who could work day and night, never had to take a vacation day, never get sick. And what would they be able to create with that? And I think that's, that's where we get into this exponential change and the ability of people to grasp that and how quickly all of this is coming. Because some people will say, well, there's two ways of looking at this. One is a year ago, chat GPT was all the rage and it was going to change the world. Well, I don't really notice much yet. The other way of looking at it is to think of how our, our minds are incapable of really grasping exponential change. So if you think if, for instance, if a technology doubled every year, then within 10 years, it would increase a thousand fold. But half of that thousand fold increase comes in the final year. And over 87% of that increase comes in the final three years. But then you, you look at the first three years of that 10 year period, and it's less than 1% of that thousand fold change. So when you're on an exponential mm -hmm. curve like that, in the early parts of that, it seems like nothing's really changing. And then all of a sudden, everything changes. I mean, think about uh, for thousands of years, people said, well, manned control of flight, that's impossible. And then the Wright brothers flew a glider for less than two minutes. 66 years later, we're on the moon. That's exponential change. And we see that all the time with product adoption, where you know a few people will adopt a new product, and then it seems like overnight everybody has it. So we're going to see that same type of impact come suddenly to a lot of people that maybe they're hearing about these things and they think, "Oh, this is way off into the future," because you tend to think incrementally that you know each year will bring the same amount of change, but it's really rapidly increasing. And at the end, it's going to be moving so fast, most people won't be able to keep up. I would say Bible prophecy itself is kind of advancing like that. John, isn't it, uh, uh, what's that saying of a bankruptcy? How'd you go bankrupt? It was, it was very yeah. slowly and then suddenly. You go gradually, <laughs> then suddenly. Gra Let me give you an example. <laughs> what this, will, I, this is one that I like to use when I talk about uh, exponential growth is how long would it take to fill Yankee Stadium with water if you went out and you, um, for example, here's a picture of Yankee Stadium. So if you went out with an eye, let's say it was completely watertight and you went out with an eyedropper at uh, second base and you every minute you're going to do a drop of water and it's not gonna evaporate or anything like that. So one minute you do one drop, two minutes you do two drops, then four drops. And the question is, how long does it take before Yankee Stadium overflows with water, doubling it every minute? And the answer is less than 50 minutes. And remember, one minute before it overflows, it's just a little over half full. So that's a, that's an example that I, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but I do think that that's an example of this gradually then suddenly. That was a quote from a Hemingway novel. How did you go bankrupt? Two ways. I went gradually then suddenly, and I think that that's a a picture of how this. Not that Hemingway's scripture, but uh, I think it's a a concept that we see when Jesus fulfilled prophecy at his first coming. 60%, actually 59% of them were fulfilled in the last week. If that's the pattern and Jewish prophecy is pattern, then that pattern will repeat. And most of the prophecies are going to be filled very quickly and in very short order at the end. And I think we see it ramping up to that in a world where the statistic I heard yesterday, and I think this is true, in the last two years, 90% of all of the information that exists has been created, exist, data and information in the last two years in human history. So, That's a, yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, you look at all these giant server farms, and they're just racks of computers that st store bits and bytes of information. And there's a, you know, the infrastructure is everywhere, these ser giant server farms. And the tech companies aren't necessarily centered in the U.S. That's probably their biggest markets, but they're building these things all over the world. Um, and there's there's some limitations. They're building a big Intel plant here, but because of their they're sort of reaching, and I think Brett has talked about molecular machines, but in terms of silicon chips, they're sort of reaching the ability to make them any smaller. So what NVIDIA has done is they've put a lot, they've made the chips bigger and configured them in a different way. So the, the chip they rolled out in, I think, May or June has the, what their own website says it has at least 200 billion transistors on each chip. It's about the size of an iPad. And then they put 200, 250 of those in a in array. And the, the amount of information that they can process is just, it's, it's mind boggling. And we're just at the start of this. Remember, ChatGPT is sort of baby steps right now. Uh, Scott, let me ask you about that because uh, you had also commented before about uh, Moore's Law. That's a uh, Gordon Moore, if I remember correctly, same one. My dad actually worked with Gordon Moore uh, back in the early 1960s. And that has to do with transistors and uh, just some conversations I remember having with my dad. My dad was, you know, a tech guy in the early days. I was not. And, um, but I, I'm, your thoughts on all of this, because a couple of things is that you've developed the Rapture Kit. Um, God's given you that ability to foresee certain things that will be able to be used after the Rapture takes place. But we see everything happening rapidly and everything that's just been described by both uh, Britt and John does define Bible prophecy in the time frame of birth pangs. Uh, this is going to happen suddenly. It's going to increase in frequency and intensity, and it is much greater than I think uh, we really imagine. Because even right now, we look at everything is happening fast. It's not just technology, but every single place we look when it comes to the signs of the times are happening at an incredible rate, but uh, way faster than we ever th they ever were before. So, but with this, we look at technology. What are your thoughts on these things and the the rapid development of everything? Well, first of all, I am a tech guy, for real. I spent most of my career, you know, in technology in various uh, positions as a technical co-founder, you know, principal data architect, chief technology officer, VP of technology, all of that stuff, right? So, I. I watch it very, very carefully. And in the past few months, as you know, uh, especially since the last conference, Tom, uh, in San Marcos there, I did a presentation on the mark of the beast technology. What does the technology look like? And I'm literally seeing all of that stuff fall into place. And, and the thing that I wanted to, to specifically mention about that is I, I don't know that any Bible prophecy guy could have seen, you know, even five years ago, what we're seeing today. I think we, at the beginning of all of this uh, last few years here, if you get the context of that, uh, we kept asking early on, we would say, why are we still here? Well, I think the reason why we're still here is because A, the Lord's not done with us yet. And he's unfolding more and more that will impact the church and awake the bride and, you know, continue to stage set the things that he himself has permitted to happen. And that is sobering to realize that none of this is taking God by surprise. And getting back to Britt's comment on AGI right now, the artificial general intelligence, the goal is to get to artificial super intelligence, which is a step beyond just general intelligence. So general intelligence means that it can solve most problems, but still is short of how humans think and what they can accomplish, you know, mentally. The super intelligent part of it, I think is still 
uh, you know, a little ways out there, but they have realized they are ahead of schedule now. Uh, Open AI, I just saw an interesting uh, commentary on this from another AI analyst saying that, you know, Open AI is not only did it shatter people's disbelief that AGI was possible because they were mocked initially. What are you talking about? You can't do that. And sure enough, you know, they are delivering step by step and they're actually ahead of the plan right now. And we see uh, unbelievable uh, advancements coming out of that group. And that open AI is helping to spur massive amounts of innovation in uh, the ecosystem surrounding that. And one of the things that I continue to look at is the pace of it is not going to stop. I've been personally uh, thinking through why is it that we keep getting, you know, con you know, needing to acknowledge uh, end user license agreements all the time. Our terms and services have been updated. It's like every week the same vendor is doing this. You come into your office in the morning, you find out that your computer rebooted overnight. Why? It seems like we're rebooting computers uh, every, you know, less than every week cadence right now. It used to be every month. And so I just think they're they're pushing, you know, basically B system stuff into place everywhere. Mobile phones, Apple, their computer chips, you know, half of their computer chips that are in the iPhone are intended for general computing, like handling web browsers and conversations and phone calls and text messages. But there's another half of it that's a lot more secretive that has to do with a, a you know, AI based scale. And so everybody's phone, uh, you know, the Google phones as well, the Android phones, they have a massive uh, compute power in them. So long story short, the amount of innovation, it is happening so fast. And the competitive advantage that is announced in the moment of a press release or a demo or another show is held less than a few days in some cases. It is literally stunning to see what they are doing. And this is coming from a tech guy. So Scott, you had, had written also about when you, you look at some of these things they're developing and we have man's plans. Men say, hey, by 2030, we're gonna de develop this. Now we're hearing by 2025 and what you're saying with open AI and the astounding speed that things are developing. But the reality of it is, Britt, with, with, with this thought still, we aren't going to go anywhere if God doesn't decide that men are gonna get there by 2030 or 2025 or whatever that window is. And also what's the concern of of a person who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ with some of these things. Some people are really worried about it that are believers. And some people are saying, eh, I, I'm not too worried about it. I'm going to be raptured. What, what are some of your thoughts on that? That's for me. Yeah. Sorry, Brent. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that if, if you know Christ, if you, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. You know, we're not meant to fear this world. But I do hear a lot of people think, it's, and have said for years, I've gotten this feedback, we'll be gone before this happens or that happens. And we have no such guarantee. Terrible things have happened throughout history to Christians that came before us in other countries. And so there's no guarantee that we won't have to deal with some of the terrible things that are coming before the tribulation period. And I want, I want to go back to John's illustration of the Yankee Stadium, because I think that's a perfect illustration of the world. Let's pretend the world is the stadium. At 50 minutes, that stadium's overflowing with water. At 46 minutes, most all of the people who are spectators in the stands have no clue that they're about to drown because they, they don't understand what's happening. Mm. And that's that's the world we're living in right now. When we talk about a lot of these things that are coming, people think that's so far off. It'll be 100 years from now before any of this stuff is done. 
and they again they don't they they're thinking in linear terms that the next year will be like the last year and not that exponential change is taking place and what it's a that normal means state bias correct yes and it, it's going to it's going to come suddenly upon people and they are going to because they can't grasp what's happening you know 20 10 years ago i did a talk at a prophecy conference in south carolina and i used a video at the end of the 2004 boxing day tsunami that occurred in the indian ocean and i use that as a picture of what's coming because the very unusual thing that happened in that tsunami is that the water in the bays in thailand drained out of the bay so people were walking out in the bay oh look at the coral reef we can walk up to it now and we don't have to get in a boat and snorkel and then some people noticed this big white cap across the entire horizon. And then somebody said, well, is that a tsunami? And you can hear the people in the background saying, oh, no, that's not a tsunami. And then about 30 seconds or less than a minute goes by and they're going, tsunami. And what you see is the locals knew what was coming and they turned and headed for higher ground. And these other people standing out there in the bay were washed away. And I think that's a picture of how this thing is going to come in the end times. There's a buildup, and then it just washes over everything. So I, I think Brett picked up on that perfectly in the Yankee Stadium analogy. It happens, and everybody, oh, you know, that, that's nothing. Don't worry about it. They never, you know, it never comes here. It never, you know, they it's not going to happen and it does. And so, you know, the answer I said to the question is, well, what's going to be fulfilled or what's going to happen in, in the world before Jesus returns? And the answer is, well, at least everything that you've seen so far. And then I think, and then some, because the world really changed four years ago this month was when a lot of restrictions and lockdowns for the Charlie Vector thing were coming into place and the world's not changed. And, and every year I start off my first update with how far are we going to get this year before we long for the good old days of, you know, 10 days ago. And each year it, it gets a little bit shorter. Uh, and boy, we'd love to go back to 2020 you know, or 2019, but that's not, I just don't think that's happening, but it, you know, the Lord is faithful and he will protect us. And we ought to always be concerned about whatever we do and how we react to all of these things. We act to his glory. Right. Thank you. Um, by the way, Zach from Wretched Watchmen and Pete Garcia are both in the, uh, they're both in the chat right now. So shout out to you guys. And uh, in fact, you could probably, you guys have probably have some great questions. Feel free to text me anything you want me to ask, ask any of these fine young men. Um, and so uh, you guys have mentioned disease X in the technology discussion before we, you know, over the last few days. And we keep hearing about disease X. Scott, I, what's the connection that in your minds you look at disease X and technology? Is it control or is it, is it, Lockdowns, or, or what's your your thought behind it? So I that's a that's actually more complex question than I think we realize right now. I think with uh, the other thing that happened four years ago, it looked relatively uh, you know dangerous. It was dangerous. I I still remember that moment when the airplanes hit the you know World Trade Center. I remember that moment. I also remember the moment where I saw people, just patients falling over, collapsed and dead in the hallway of Chinese hospitals. I do remember that. Another one of those moments, you, you just can't unsee that. And so it was pretty frightening back then. Well, I think that one of the things that I just saw again for reference is Bill and Melinda Gates and their, uh, their forecasting of the next pandemic, okay? And the thing that I just detest, honestly, is the evil glee that I witnessed in their faces as Bill says right at the camera, you know, 
the next one will be much worse. And Melinda Gates had this smile that I just, I just can't get that out of my head right now. And it's just this unbelievable evil that we know what's coming probably because they're, mm. you know, in control of it. And they said the next one will be much worse. Well, let's get to disease X. I, I follow John Campbell in the UK for this type of information. He's very good, very reliable, very, very well respected. And so I have uh, been listening to his take on disease X too. And it's supposed to be 20 times as lethal as the first one that we had a few years ago. And that is pretty sobering to hear that. And I think the bottom line that the elites and the others that are planning these things want is control. Because remember, I think there was this curve where we let go of so many of our rights and we, we basically yielded to fear in so many ways. And I think that uh, we've been toughened up a little bit through that. I think there's the, the church has more discernment right now, thankfully. But I also hear this bravado in a false bravado, I would uh, basically say, which is I'm not doing that again, as in, you know, taking that uh, medication. And as though, you know, we can prevail through this, and yet you hear 20 times the lethality, and you have to imagine the vice grip that is going to be put on the world. And their goal is population reduction. There's no other way to think through these things except to realize they just want to take out people. And I think that they'll. And this lines up perfectly with Bible prophecy. Just look at the four horsemen and all that happens there. So it is absolutely in the correct trajectory for what we uh, anticipate that scripture reveals to us is going to occur as soon as we're gone. But it is, it's bad. I mean, disease X, I think they'll say, well, you could say that you're going to resist and won't do this. You won't follow or eat it, but we know better. And it's that evil mm -hmm. side of it that I just, uh, you know, I, I remember Bill when he was a normal human being back in the tech world. <laughs> I, I didn't know he was ever normal, but <laughs> he was he was a smart guy. But well, I Scott's didn't from understand. A, he's from the tech industry, so he's he's used to oh. nerds, you know. Oh, so. okay. yeah, thank you, God. <laughs> Gracefully said, brother. <laughs> so yeah, he used to be someone I admired and looked up to, and uh, oh my goodness, he's probably one of the most evil men in the world right now. So. I, I just think that it's disease X is very, it's very threatening and they're doing this to broadcast again. I think there's a mercy involved in the Lord allowing these evil people to communicate ahead of time what they're going to do. They definitely it telegraph. Helps, it definitely helps the church to get ready and to be prepared. It, it should alert the church. John, this, uh, Pete Garcia has a question for you and it's right along the lines of, what Scott was talking about. But first of all, before I get to the question from Pete, Pete also texted and said there's solar uh, flare R3 caused uh, an outage today, first in modern history. Or you, I, I, I woke up this morning hearing that something happened to Verizon, AT&T, in in, oh, from coast to coast. Is that what <laughs> that's a reference to? Yeah, yeah, there was a, a big outage in the cell phone companies. I have AT and T. Uh, it's like everybody, everybody at the big tech companies knows exactly who I'm with and probably who I call and talk to and text with anyway, since they're gathering, sucking up all my data all the time. But yeah, there's some thinking that this big solar flare today uh, caused that, and so there was a huge outage. Now we didn't have it here in Ohio, but I will tell you about a. A week ago, I had some things that I was trying to do, and my internet went down. So I go to my cell phone, and AT and T is down, and I'm like, I'm kind of stuck, you know, because the internet is our phone. It's our now the it was Super Bowl Sunday, and amazingly, the cable company sent two guys out here during the Super Bowl game to get my internet back up on Sunday evening of the Super Bowl. Uh, so. They, I guess they figure they have a big, a, a nice mark here in me paying those big monthly bills that they charge or something. But th this is a big deal. I mean, because we are entering a period of activity of the sun 
And here in Ohio, in about uh, 45 days, Monday, April the 8th, uh, where I live, we'll be in the path of totality of an eclipse. And it'll be the only one like, well, the next one will be 2099, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be here for that one. Like, uh, but Unless uh, you get so, augmented by Yuval No Harari stuff. Yeah, he <laughs> may be here. Well, I, 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 I will be around in some fashion in 2099. I'm just, you know, I'm pretty sure my location won't be Ohio. Uh, <laughs> but that's good. <laughs> It'll be it'll be something. It won't be known as Ohio in those days. It could so. be the Ohio of the uh, of the Millennial Kingdom, John. There you go. It's a- right, right. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I think I want Scotland though. If I get a place to rule and reign, I'll I'll take Scotland. <laughs> so so along these lines, along what both you said and and Scott had mentioned. So Pete just threw this out there. Um, do you see? one big black swan event or a bunch of little ones strategically timed to disrupt the upcoming election. Any of you could answer that. I'll you answer that. Little- yes. Yeah. I, I, I think, and you know, that's one of the questions you have coming up about the Tucker Carlson interview. So if yeah, you want to get to that now, I'll, we can do well, that. I'll tell you, let, they're related. Well, let me get to, um, all right, we'll just, we'll just go there. So Pete, your question's getting, uh, Uh, wrapped into uh, this other one I have. So, John, you stated that Tucker Carlson recently posted a video on censorship and said it's probably the most important ever, most important one he's ever done. Uh, And that's very interesting in light of he just uh, interviewed Putin recently, too. Yeah, it it, it sort of it came on the heels of his interview of Putin, where I thought Putin is a master. I mean, Putin is like the biggest crime boss on the planet and the master liar deceiver. Um, and, and he's going to win the war in Ukraine, by the way, but be that as it may, you know, he, I, he played Tucker and he even said it afterwards. I, I think I got away with a lot. The guy never asked me a tough question and he didn't. I had a whole list of them that I would like to ask, but so then put, then Tucker went to the world government, world governments summit it's not no longer the world government summit i think they were being too uh revealing with the name so now it's called world governments summit i mean that makes everybody feel better right and at the uh and and tucker he gave a very what i would consider to be a very pathetic answer on the middle east situation but then he came out with a, a very good video i think it was the best interview he ever did he did one with rfk jr that i thought was pretty good when he was still at the fox but this one with mike benz mike benz cyber if you want to follow him on uh x or twitter and he talked about how all of these government agencies have been sort of dragooned in with the tech companies. So our, the government can't restrict speech. So they've outsourced it to all these tech companies. There's a guy at uh, Stopping uh, stopping Hate or something like that. And it's just one guy. And he's essentially shut down monetization for Glenn Beck on his YouTube videos because Glenn was going against the narrative on climate change. One guy. And the way he's doing it, if you go to his website, uh, I think it's stoppinghate.com or .org, he says, I did it using AI. And what you're seeing is there's there's a company from the UK called Moonshot that was brought in by the Canadian government and then sort of, and what they're doing is they're evaluating text and information that's being shared on social media. and they're they're taking it down, they're throttling it and that type of thing. So you have seen nothing yet till you see what's going to happen in this election. So go watch the Tucker interview. It's an hour, four minutes long and follow Mike Benz. You will get a lot of information about what's going on and what's happening. And I, and I will tell you, it is frightening because I don't know what's going to happen in this next election. I have a pretty good idea that a lot of it's not going to be good. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that. that. I, and I, I, I just think I, it, 
Britt, I, I'll give so, you a chance so, in a minute, Britt. So what they did was they, <laughs> they gave the technology companies and, and so they come out and they say, we're doing this to protect democracy. But what they really mean by that is we're protecting the democratic institutions that we now have control of, like courts or federal agencies or things like that. In, in Israel, the big battle's been over the Supreme Court. And you can argue the merits about it. Clearly, everybody agrees they need to reform the Supreme Court. But because it's proposed by people on the, quote, far right, we can't, it, it's tearing apart Israeli society and what it is, it's in, by the way, so the democratically elected government of Israel puts in place a democratically passed in the Knesset law to restrict the powers of the judiciary. And what's the protest? Those crazy far right people are destroying democracy by acting in a democratic fashion. It's insane because what they really want to protect is the institution that they control and does their bidding. It's the same thing here in the United States, and you're going to see a lot of it over the next six months. Eight, well, nine months until this election so, takes place. Leading up to the election. Britt, you've been quiet for a little while. So <laughs> as, as we look at censorship, uh, rest of 2024, obviously we have the election coming. Uh, the question uh, from Pete, do we see a black swan event? Um, the Everything that John just said, I, mean, I look at 2024, you've talked about censorship many times before, and we have an election. Just, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think certainly they're going to do everything they can to control the outcome of the election. But again, I don't, I maybe have a different point of view in saying that I think the plans will be, will unfold regardless of who wins an election or doesn't win an election. So we know our monetary system is coming to its mathematical end. And just as we saw it, it, you know, the plan might be to have certain people win the election and then everything falls apart afterwards and get bl gets blamed on them. So I <laughs> really, I, I don't know necessarily what plans are going to unfold, mm. but I don't think it's the next year, two years, five years is not going to be uh, wonderful, right? It's going to be, just as John said before, you'll be longing for the days of 10 days ago. Because it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, there's so many issues in the world and particularly with uh, with the economy, and and again the monetary system coming to its end. I think there's a reason they telegraphed. You talked about they telegraphed these things ahead of time. Last year, all we heard about was central bank digital currencies, how they're getting this rolled out, this tested here. Now we don't hear so much about that, but they haven't gone away. <laughs> and what they're going to do on the in the aftermath of the next financial crisis, whenever that is, they're going to roll those out as the solution. And they're going to roll that out as the solution. They're actually going to roll out the surveillance aspects and the programmability aspects of central bank digital currency as a benefit to people. Oh, well, we could have prevented Bernie Madoff's fraud because when people... Uh, gave their retirement funds to him to invest, we would have seen that he didn't invest it. And we would have been able to stop that fraud. We could have stopped those terrorists. And especially as we're going into a, a world where we see what a small group in Yemen is able to control the shipping lanes in the Red Sea, we're going to see more and more powerful technologies develop in the years ahead to where an individual could wreak massive havoc and people will be crying out and say, I don't, I don't know how many people have seen the, the film Slaughterbots. You can look that up online and look at just sort of a glimpse of what may be coming in the future. And when you look at the vulnerability that people will have in their everyday lives to those types of attacks, especially from a terrorist, the government could use that fear to say, well, we need the surveillance technology. We need all these surveillance technologies to make sure we're tracking those individuals so that we can stop them. And that's exactly what we hear governments saying today, especially in the United States. Well, these 
extremist, right? And they never really define it, but it's really their political enemies that are the extremist. And, but they sell people on this idea that it's necessary to have the surveillance. Uh, so we were in uh, the land down under just a week and a half ago, uh, two weeks ago, in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, it was very interesting. We were, uh, we noticed our, the guy who was driving with us, John, um, was going the speed limit. And one of the guys commented, why is everybody going the same speed? And he said, you see that? Let's drive a little further. See that? See it? There are cameras everywhere. And you get a ticket. You get a ticket for not having a seatbelt on. You get a ticket for speeding. Same thing was happening in New Zealand. And I got word that the digital ID tracking is going to begin this summer in Australia. And uh, two individuals that are rather high up in the government there have already uh, bailed the country. So I'll just leave it at that. And I, I'm hearing these things. Scott... I mean, I'm looking at what is developing uh, ID tracking. I believe there are certain areas that have been test grounds. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and even Hawaii to some extent. Uh, they, they seem to be like almost like guinea pigs. Let's test these things out here. But these things are happening at the same time. I'm thinking about everything that, that Britt and John said. If there, there can easily be a fake cyber attack blamed on whoever you want to blame it on. Blame it on China, blame it on Russia, something planned by our own government, the CIA or something like that. As, my, as I think about these things and how they're going to bring about CBDCs and digital tracking and get people to go along with it, uh, wouldn't it be an event like that? Something disastrous, yes, so catastrophic? I, I think that... Uh... Again, another complex, nuanced, you know, area here. But I think that there's uh, no doubt in my mind at this point that everything that needs to be in place is already there. And I think that uh, we talked about the the mobile phone outage today with AT and T and others, and how that cascaded. You know, it's easy for me to close my eyes and think, okay, that was another war gaming exercise. So that was, let's see what the people do. Let's see how, you know, people react to this. Are they fearful? How could we do this better next time? I just think that there's puppet masters that are, remember, they're already a global cabal of Luciferians and willing uh, actors. You know, I love J.B. Hickson's and his take on the Antichrist spirit. I learned a lot from him. And so it's one of those things where, you know, unfortunately, you think to yourself, OK, so they do need to practice what they're doing. And that's why they have willing people. You know, even the BRICS, look at who some of the BRICS members are, South Africa being one of them. And you would ask yourself, well, they're not an economic powerhouse. They're a very, you know, their economy isn't doing great. And why are they even a part of this? Well, they're a test case. And so I think that I see some of these things as we need to roll out enough of this technology so that we can improve the real technology that's yet to fully be unloaded right. upon the world. And that is a very right. smart thing to do to test, you, you know, test these things. And so when you have uh, the global uh, young leaders coming out of the WEF, you know, the World Economic Forum, and they've all been indoctrinized to what's going to happen, and they are all privy to certain parts of the plan, and they're in high positions of authority. Well, they're the, the people that have control of a country now, and they're the ones that are executing the plan. And so the, the intentionality of, around what we see today, and we'll never really know this side of heaven, I suppose, what all the machinations of men are, but I can tell you that the backroom meetings and all the things that they're doing today, if we were a fly on the wall, I think we would be heartbroken to see, you know, the intent of man, you know, always being evil continuously. I think we would say, you know, that is something that uh, we see justice and coming 
you know, and I don't know that we'll be around here for long, but we have to be cautious. I've said that in a number of years now. I think we'll see more because I don't know that the bride is ready yet. We're still slumbering in many ways and enough pressure hasn't been exerted yet for us to snap out of it and to start asking the really key questions like, what is going on? I need to, I need answers now and to have people begin the long process of connecting the dots, which is why I love to speak to the watchmen and watchwomen in our audience today. To just remind everyone, our effort, our years of, you know, sacrifice to be prepared for this time in history has not been wasted. All that mocking and scoffing is simply validation that we're on the right path and that pastors and other organizations, people all over will begin asking those questions and they're going to remember that we're the watchmen or watchwoman in the congregation. And they're going to, all of a sudden, that smirkiness is going to be off. You know, they're, they're going to be sobered. And I think these things that we see right here, I think that's one reason why I believe uh, we're still here and still seeing this. The Lord's purpose for us is not done yet. And so I just see that uh, a lot of the stage setting is ready to go. And now they're in full beta testing mode. And it'll be interesting to see how, you know, Britt is an expert on CBDCs as well. And I can't wait to see what happens there. It's going to be fascinating to see exactly what happens. So with that, uh, Britt, um, everything Scott just said, and then after Britt, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, John, to also, uh, I want to hear your thoughts on this. So on specific what? Specific well, well, what everything that Scott had just said, he was just he was just talking about CBDCs. You being an expert on it and the direction everything is going, and uh, the the remnant believer reaching out to them because there are these scary things that are taking place and the scary predictions that are coming. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree fully with Scott that. Our purpose, the, the purpose the Lord gave us isn't done yet. That's why we're still here. And that's why we need to be doing everything we can with whatever little time we have left. I often say we can see the finish line. I don't know how far away it is, but when you're running a marathon and you see the finish line, that's the time to sprint. It's not the time to slow down and relax, sit on a bench. We can see these things. Jesus said, when you begin to see all these things take place, I'm right at the door my return is near. So we should be doing everything we can to share the gospel with as many people as possible. And with respect to central bank digital currencies, I think that's a perfect tool for evangelism it because is. what people use, they, they, people engage in financial transactions every day. So if you're at Starbucks and you see somebody pay with cash, say, you know, enjoy that while you can. Well, what do you mean? Right. Well, they're they're going to do away with cash. Haven't you heard about the central bank digital currencies? And that opens up a whole discussion with them about what that is. And depending on what they say, you can point out, well, you know, the Bible foretold that almost 2000 years ago. And even if they shut down the conversation at that moment, you've planted that seed that may germinate later when they start to see these events unfold and they think, I remember somebody said the Bible talked about that. Maybe I should go investigate that. Mm -hmm. So I think this, many of the things we're seeing are perfect tools for evangelism, for spreading the good news about Jesus Christ and transforming people's lives. Uh, as far as central bank digital currencies, again, I think we're on that pathway. They've, they've been laying the groundwork for that. I think we're going to see a financial crisis in the very near future. I think there's most likely next month we're going to see an emerging banking crisis. And I think probably there's a finer distinction with that. It, it's more of a small and regional banking crisis because the big banks, while they have their own problems, they control the central banks. And so much like we saw in the Great Depression, we saw bank failures, but J.P. Morgan was still around. <laughs> so people... When people hear about the Federal Reserve, they think, 
Well, it's federal, it's the government, but it is not. It's owned by the largest banks. So it's there to serve the banks and their interests. So when we see these smaller banks fail, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, they'll be there to pick up the pieces and grow even larger. And then the the result of this collapse when people are losing so much is going to be to create this fear. Well, we can restore everything. You have an account with the Federal Reserve. They can print dollars and central banks all over the world. Yen, euros, doesn't matter what it is. We can print that. We can make you whole. And then they've already claimed in Europe, well, it's not going to be programmable. You don't have to worry about that. But of course, we know that it, it will be. Even if it's not initially, once you get hooked, then it will be. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, we didn't intend to do that. That's usually what they say right before they do something. We didn't intend to do that. And then they do it. <laughs> Seems like it's just a really good idea, you know. It's, 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 look, look, the Bank of International Settlements, which is sort of the central bank of central banks. What's that guy's name, uh, Brett? Augustus Karstens or something like that, who's always go into these conferences and stuff and talk about, well, we'll use this for control. And then Christine uh, Lagarde, uh, is she the European Central Bank head? You know, she, remember that really weird thing she did with the seven thing at the, in the New York conference years ago? I mean, they're, they're very bizarre people. So, Tom, what you said about the cameras, I noticed this in Scotland as I was driving around and as I came from the far north back down sort of towards Glasgow and Sterling, um, you know, there were cameras all over the place. And it, it, I became more concerned about the cameras than what was going on the road ahead of me, which didn't seem to be safe, but they, they do this thing. They, they monitor your average speed. And I watch guys, they would drive like 90 miles an hour. Then they would hit a camera thing and they would drive 50, you know, because that averaged out then to 70. Uh, so they knew how to game the system. But I, I paid it. A, it was in a little town called Tain, spending the night. I went to get some stuff at a big, uh, I think it's called ASDA store. A big, you know, sort of like a Walmart type thing. It had like a whole row of shelves of canned fish. That was the unusual thing. But I, so I bought stuff. I checked out and I was using my American Express gold card. It took a picture of me at the checkout and somebody had to come over and approve it. I started to walk out to the, before I got to the door, I remembered, oh, I forgot to get some water. So I went back and I come up to the thing to pay the checkout and my picture pops up on the screen that had just been taken. I'm in, I'm in the system already and it's facial recognition. It's kind of freaky. Uh, and But even with cash, you're going to get tracked. If you, if you go to Costco and you have to pay, you have to show your card and you pay cash, you can go to your Costco app and you can see everything that you bought, even with cash. So you can't, you can't hide anything there. So it's all being tracked and they'll control the point of sale, even for cash. And I don't, I don't know how you're going to get around the system. That's, that's one of the things. So I, I think it's coming. I think it'll be far reaching and it's, uh, you know, what Tom, was it your interview with Patrick Wood, where he said, you know, the, at the middle of the of the tribulation, uh, the abomination of desolation, the antichrist and false prophet don't get together for a meeting then and say, hey, you know, how are we going to crowdfund this mark of the beast thing? <laughs> you know, they're not going to do that. They're just going to say, okay, we can flip the switch of the stuff that's already in place and take it over. And I, th- I think that's how it's going to work. Well, speaking of crowdfunding, Right, we look at was the Sam Altman who's now raising seven trillion dollars. There's massive expenses that are involved in the AI technology in the direction everything is going. Um, massive amounts of energy too. Uh, I read a report just recently that said uh, something like 25 percent of the energy for that's that's produced in the United States is going to be needed to run the AI systems in just. Uh, by 2025, how is that even possible, Scott? How how is that possible? 
Well, first of all, uh, energy is definitely an issue until, you know, you, unless you continue to miniaturize because that'll reduce electrical consumption in chips. But the fact of the matter is that uh, they'll find a way to do it. And each of these data centers that are being uh, built right now, uh, not only are connected to the grid, but they have very sophisticated backup energy systems because technically those systems should never go down. You know, that's the whole point of a data center and it's redundant power supply and it's redundant air conditioning, et cetera. So it's one of the pieces uh, that they need to, that it's one of the factors that they look at before they make an investment in a data center is can we get power reliably and is it uh, cost effective for us? So, but I think miniaturization and new material science, there's some uh, recent news. I haven't had a chance to fully uh, research this yet, but uh, that is saying that a breakthrough a material science breakthrough on batteries is just around the corner. And I'd like to, to just throw in one of the things that I just absolutely uh, was fascinated by recently, I saw an article about how AI is beginning to connect to a robot. And that robot actually has a kind of like a command and control area full of material components and, and different chemicals and different resources. And what it's doing 24 seven nonstop is it's experimenting with new materials and it's doing it completely autonomously at the control of the AI. And it's learning and getting more and more sophisticated. And there's a shot of one of the data centers right there. That's so, New Albany, Ohio, about and so 15 minutes the, from my house. The idea here is the what what's really mind blowing is what does this mean? And we've always been concerned about AI starting to have a presence in the real world, and it it does that with robots. Okay, so when they could do that, you see phenomenal things. So the the example with material science is just to give you one use case was that man, human, human beings have created 20,000, let's call it units of new material research. And computationally intensive algorithms have created, uh, I would say 40,000 40, of these units. But the AI assisted one has done 420,000 units. So the AI part of it, Tom, is astronomically more efficient and better at what uh, is happening. And it's all, all it's doing is brute force experimentation and learning. And But if you do that enough and enough and you keep experimenting, you start to get those, those neural networks to understand the best and most optimal way of doing something and the breakthroughs that are coming is it is supposed to be uh, absolutely jaw dropping. Of course, all of it's very secret right now. As we watch all of the, the rapid development of all of these things going on, uh, Scott, can you uh, tell me what is Gemma? You you talked a little bit about Gemma. Gemma is that what it is? <clears throat> yeah. I, I was hooked on phonics. I learned in Catholic <laughs> school when I was a kid. I only learned phonics, so it looks yeah. like Gemma to me. And uh, so with Gemma, you wrote this, which is very interesting. Uh, now Google just rolled out a new open model Gemma. Any kid in a garage can become a billionaire almost overnight. So what what is this? Well, uh, and I think... Britt would uh, also have a very important perspective on this, but I think with the pace of innovation that we're seeing, uh, one of the trends that I'm almost struggling to understand, how can they do this exactly? But they're starting to, it, there's a wider acceptance of making these large language models and its subsets publicly available. They're open source. And that is a staggering thing. And the leader in this that is the most to uh, to most at stake is Meta. Meta has put their Llama engine in the open source. And what that means is that anybody, here's the illustration with the kid in the garage. 
anybody that wants to download basic, effectively the billions of dollars that Meta has invested in AI and the training and put it on their computer and start thinking and l playing with it and innovating and being creative with it, that is within the reach of the average teenager nowadays. And so just like Steve Jobs and Wozniak back in the day when they were developing the Apple computer in the garage, I see an explosion of, you know, innovation coming, which is why you'll hear financial analysts say that there is unbelievable wealth that will be created in the next few years because of this principle is that it doesn't need a lot of investment anymore. You have an open source AI that you can take and work with, and you've got a laptop that's a thousand dollars and and before you know it, you're able to create software. You can put it on a uh, uh, software as a service website and you can start uh, charging subscription fees for it. All of a sudden it attracts investors. And next thing you know, you're acquired. And this is happening more and more often right now. And can just I to ask one more. Go ahead, just, Scott. Go I ahead, want to ask one a question. Uh, then I want to ask Britt a question. Yeah, one more thing that I think is very, very in in interesting is there's now the coding tools are so refined now for programming that there's a whole mini cottage industry coming up around what's called no code or low code tools. That is to say you drag and drop software and define it uh, without having to actually understand the language or any programming at all. And that is creating a lot of uh, opportunities and wealth. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, Brett, John, so you're going to say something. so, Brett. Somebody who listens to me, so I talk about AI and coming and these big investments and the wealth and you know a, a seminar I listened to yesterday is talking about a two hundred trillion dollar market. And, you know, this is and they're talking it's going to be bigger than the uh, the uh, fourth industrial, you know, the prior industrial revolutions, the amount of money that's going to be invested in that type of thing, and then the so I talk about that, and then somebody who listens to you says, but Bridgelette says all the money's going away and the world's collapsing and that type of thing. And so they're not going to be able to have the money to build it anyway. So how do you respond to that? Because I know that's not what you think. I don't think right. that's I would say, think, but... <laughs> I would say that's a misinterpretation of what I've what I've said. Um, you know, I've talked about there's there's going to be a financial crisis. In the near term, I think we're in a global depression right now, and that'll become apparent in due time. I believe the reaction from the central banks of the world is going to be to print and short, sort of shift that in the other direction. But historically, and people can look up studies on this type of thing. But actually, times of economic downturn lead to greater innovation. Just as Scott was saying, you probably have some people that are in jobs that they think are safe and secure. And they're comfortable in that way, and they may have much more to contribute to the world. And we saw this back in the great financial crisis, people that got laid off and then said, well, now's the time to start that business I always wanted to start. And they did it. And now it's a thriving business that's employing multiple people, and they're doing better than they ever did. So economic downturn doesn't necessarily mean that... Um, these innovations go away, just the exact opposite. And in fact, you know, again, the governments, you, you mentioned before, the cash that these companies are sitting on that are pushing this innovation, they're not going to be in, impacted at all by an economic downturn like that. The governments, there's so much at stake. You're talking about $200 trillion in the economic stakes for companies. Vladimir Putin said in 2017, the leader in artificial intelligence will rule the world. That's some pretty big stakes. And the nations of the world are not going to put those plans on hold for any reason. This is a race. I believe they've all been racing. There's probably Manhattan Project type projects going on right now as we speak with the nations of the world racing toward bringing these key technologies to critical mass, specifically quantum computing, AI, and molecular manufacturing. Because literally the, the ruler, the, the one that <laughs> wins that race can conquer the world, can rule the world. So 
I don't see this uh, stopping that technological development. Again, if you go back and look, technological development wasn't suppressed by the Great Depression at all. So I, I wouldn't expect any sort of economic downturn short of something, you know, like the bubonic plague that <laughs> takes out large portions of humanity. But simple economic downturns, market crashes generally have very little impact on technological development and innovation. When you look at the Bible and it talks about the time just before the second coming of Christ, people are buying and selling in they're planting, they're sowing. They, everything seems to be quite good. But we do know there is the black horse of the book of Revelation too. So we find both of the dynamics happening within that period of, of, uh, of the last days. An economic catastrophe, yet everything going good when people are suddenly caught by surprise when everything is going quite well. But I look at these dynamics and there's no way anybody could convince me that any of the pursuits and technology will slow down simply because of what Vladimir Putin said. Any leader in the world, and there's a lot of really bad leaders out there, um, most of which I would say are not good, and then you have all the other people in all the various places of governments we can think of right here in our own country with CIA and FBI and Homeland Security and different places where we don't even know about then you throw in DARPA and everything else. There's a lot of people out there that would like to control everything and they all know the same thing, what, what Putin said. So this is only going to get faster and faster. Everybody's going to race to the top of it. But at the same time, th this really intrigues me. Um, one of you had mentioned that artificial intelligence, it, it says, uh, uh, relationships are making inroads for the next billion dollar industry. We've talked a little bit about that. But then what if you mentioned this, the final straw for marriage with the question mark and kids with the question mark. And I'm wondering what, what you meant by that, because it set my mind thinking about a particular passage in the Bible. But I think it was you, Scott. Do you remember writing that? You know, I'm, I'm looking at our notes here, and I recall that. Rephrase the question, Tom, please. Oh, that's a, that's long because I made up mo most of it while I was sitting here. So uh, <laughs> you were talking about, uh, you because you would run through a litany of different topics, right? Uh, and one of them, you have AI relationships are making inroads for the next yeah, million dollar industry. I, I think what's happening and this is uh fascinating and predictable honestly is that uh, ais which are based on the ability to mimic humans and to be relational okay. so to speak in chats and things like that are actually forming bonds it's not the ai that's forming a bond it's the people you know men specifically that are forming bonds with ai you know uh call them uh, women. I don't know what you'd call them. It's an AI. And so I see that, and, and they're paying lots of money to have access to this AI persona. And I, you know, because, and you hear their comments about why they do that, why they prefer that. And it just reads like Orwellian stuff is they, they don't want the hassle of a relationship. They don't want to have, uh, you know, the inconveniences of disagreements in a relationship. They don't want any of that stuff. Uh, they just want the interaction. And, and even if it's a shallow form of intimacy, it's still better in their mind than, you know, a real mm -hmm. world. And so I think, you know, one of the things that, that the Bible does predict is that there'll be the end of marriage, right, yeah. Tom? First Timothy and, chapter four. I was gonna. Well, I was gonna throw that out your way. Yeah. If 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 men and women are out, you know, have their little digital assistants, and all of a sudden it's so compelling, and they're working on agent technology today right now. Agents are those things that can be commanded by you, the user, to, to go do something useful for them. They're working very very hard on that right now, and if they're develop a relationship. Uh, just through compliance and uh, what would you like for me to do now? And they talk soft and friendly and they're empathetic because they've been trained to do that. 
you know, they don't know what they're doing, but they train, they're uh, repeating what their neural programming is, is uh, embedded in there. And all of a sudden you've got this false uh, paradigm that will be very irresistible for many people, unfortunately. Well, I, I, just based on what you said, this passage did come to my mind that you were talking about in a context as this. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving, or meats, literally, which God created to be received with thanksgiving. We've entered into a world, and technology has a lot to do with it, that you, you've already... People's minds are already messed up because of the gender stuff. Then you throw in these the type of thing that you're just talking about right now, Scott, and, and you have it here, forbidding to marry and commanding that you don't eat meat. I mean, what a world we are living in right now when something like this becomes the conversation that we're having. But uh, I'm going to ask all three of you this because I'm just curious. So, uh, Britt, I'll start with you. And um, it, it mentions in your doctrines of demons and uh, giving heed to doctrines, demons, and deceiving spirits. When it comes to AI technology, what is the ability in your thoughts of uh, uh, demons being directing this behind this, um, working with the people who are developing things? How is it that we are so advanced? When you look back at Nazi Germany, they had certain abilities. If you go back in biblical history to the time of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, and even a secular history, it appears that technology was quite advanced in centuries way, way past when you look at the buildings of the pyramids and other things. But yet here we are, and we see this unbelievable exponential growth in, in technology. Do you think there is demonic influence that is helping to aid this growth, or is it just really smart men that all happen to come about at the same time? Well, I think it's, it's it, when we look at the Tower of Babel story, you know, what was the reason that God intervened in that? He says, given their unification, their single language, nothing will be impossible for them. So that's why God intervenes, breaks up what's happening. So I think it's the natural inclination of man who has the same uh, desire that Satan has, which we read about in Isaiah chapter 14, to be like the Most High. And we read in 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 says, God will send a strong delusion and people will believe the lie. When you think about, well, what's that lie? I, I think it's the lie from Genesis 3 the serpent in the Garden of Eden saying, you will be like God. And when we look at these technologies and what they're doing, what they're promising, it seems like God-like powers. And thus we get people like Yuval Noah Harari saying exactly that, saying we, we are gods. We are going to rule this world. And so, yes, I think it's demonic influence, but I also think that it's man's fallen nature. That's just, this is our desire. It's the same as Satan's. It's to be in the place of the most high. And you know, the Antichrist is the epitome of that. It, instead of Christ, in place of Christ. And so the world is going to look to the Antichrist as their God. The Bible says the world will worship him. And so I think that's that's exactly where we're going, is this world where people are in not just spiritual rebellion against God, but actual physical rebellion against God. I think that's where we're headed. Yeah. Uh, Scott, do you think uh, uh, these machines can be possessed? Or no, I'm not... I'm, I don't. Okay. I'm not a big fan of the idea that a spiritual entity... Uh, can command and control a physical computer. I, I just don't see that happening. However, to Britt's point, you know, so the idea of possession, I don't, I don't agree with that. 
I don't think possession is necessary to achieve what is needed to be done from, you know, the enemy's point of view, because look, those AI models, they're training initially off the internet. Think of the filth and the depravity and the wrongful thinking, the the 99.999% of the internet, which does not have a biblical worldview. You see where I'm going with this? That's what the AIs are learning from. And I think there's sufficient imprint of depravity and sin and everything else in the things that are being ingested by these training models to fully account for the evil, you know, that is that is supposed to be there. So I, you know, and look, from the human conspirator point of view, you know, it's well known that uh, this is not everybody in Silicon Valley. I don't want to say that, but certain people in Silicon Valley will microdose hallucinogens every day. It's part of their routine. And they're, they're, the benefit that they think that they achieve for themselves is enhanced creativity, okay? And production and ability to have leaping thoughts of, of innovative uh, ways and of approaches to solve problems. So, but they're not understanding because they, again, do not have a biblical worldview, is that that is opening up a demonic portal. And so my, my point is that I think that software developers and executives and all these people that attend Burning Man, for example, is very hedonistic thing that they do every now and then. It is absolutely uh, possible that there's uh, demonic possession in that and oppression and influence and control through human actors, actually, that are then important people that are involved in computer scientific endeavors. And that's how another source of that negative stuff comes into it. Mm, thank you. John, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I know you, you know, all I, have thoughts. I think I speak back to the <clears throat> that Britt brought up the Tower of Babel as kind of a pattern of what we see being constructed here in front of our eyes. This time it's kind of virtual, technological, not this physical thing. But the principle behind it is the same thing. And one thing we know is that the Tower of Babel did not get finished before God intervened. So I, I trust that that pattern will hold this time. It was a little over a year ago, I was at the Christian Media Summit in Israel. And I've mentioned this a number of times, um, Jonathan um, Medved, an uh, entrepreneur in Israel, was talking about the greatness of the Abraham Accords and how it was going to be $100 billion of trade with Israel and these Arab countries in the Abraham Accords. And now they're talking it would be in the trillions. Uh, things change that quickly, assuming they, they stay in place. But he made a very interesting comment about how great this, he mentioned ChatGPT and AI and how this was going to be wonderful. Everybody should invest in it. It's going to lead to a lot of economic growth. And then he said this very interesting phrase and I, I'm sitting in Jerusalem and he says, and we will make the lame walk. And I like almost kind of fell off my chair. And then, so I went back and looked at the Neuralink video, introductory videos. And if you look at the progression there, it was the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, which is the same evidence for messianic signs that John, that Jesus gave to the disciples of John who came and said, are you, are you the one or should we look for some another? And Jesus, did you go back and tell John what you see? The lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. And so there's a very messianic quality, fake messianic quality to the stuff that's being developed. Scott mentioned the psychedelics that are involved. And you know, that that really squares with the pharmacia sorcery part of revelation that they're using these. And I mean, the, the, the board at, at Tesla is upset with Elon Musk, or shall I say 
Elon Musk's handler because she's not, you know, keeping him away from the magic mushrooms often enough. You know, there, there's been a big, it's been playing out in the public. So we just need to understand that all of these, all of these things are in play on the spiritual. We, we talk about AI and technology, but there, there is a spiritual side to it. I, I think I agree with Scott. It's not so much that there's a demon in the machine, but the machine is learning and spewing out information that it's getting from demon inspired people. And that's, that's where the problem comes in. I'm going can, to I add some, on, can I yeah, add on to that? Ahead. I own to what yeah. they both said, which is that, you know, the, the technology is neutral. It's neither good nor evil. The wickedness, the evil is in the human heart. You know, there's nothing wrong with a train. There's nothing wrong with an oven. There's nothing wrong with a shower head or an assembly line. But the human heart combined all of those things into Nazi extermination camps. So technology is a tool like any other, but the wickedness is in the human heart. That's that's where the problem is coming from with all of this. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I'm going to throw this your way also, Britt. As we look at all the technology that's here, we hear about deep fakes. Um, there is a... Scott, I was thinking of this when you were talking. There was an Instagram model that apparently some very wealthy men and Hollywood A-listers were hitting on, trying to contact through direct message or whatever. And she was an AI. She was a fake. She was a total fake. And they were fooled by her, but she was a fake. Uh, there was supposed to be some newscast that was going to start in the Los Angeles area I think in February or March, I don't know if it started yet. And the whole the whole thing was going to be these AI fake newscasters. But as we look at this, it's I mean, it has developed a lot. I mean, it's gotten a lot better, this type of thing, just within the last year. A lot better. In the last uh, week, Tom. In the last the innovation, uh, yeah, coming out of open AI's. Uh, generative AI uh, image analysis, they could do just with one sentence, they, it can generate a very realistic looking one minute video now. What, what's un, that it's called? Sora? Sora? Sora or something? S-O-R-O, -O. yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I played a clip of that because they did one. Uh, give us a historical picture of uh, California village during the town during the gold rush. And it looked pretty good. Except I'm sure the streets were a lot cleaner than they really were. They were dirt, but they they looked pretty, you know, nice. And then somebody wrote to me, and I didn't have time to go back and check. I said, you know, I noticed the satellite dish on one of those buildings in the uh, mm -hmm. artificially generated, uh, AG, uh, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence generated uh, video. But they're pretty realistic. I mean, some of the guys from the Lincoln Project, which is notoriously anti-Trump did up a video of Fred Trump, Donald Trump's father, castigating what a miserable, lousy person he was, and I'm ashamed that you're my son, and that type of thing, and put it up. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna see and that and that look was pretty good. It was in Fred Trump's voice. And it's it's gonna be hard to determine what's real um going forward. Yeah. On that question, uh Brit, just looking at it, hard to determine what's real. The deception is going to grow exponentially. I mean, we look at the deception that we've just witnessed the last four years, but we can see this, things that John and Scott were just referring to, things you've written about, massive deception. We, we can't turn to the left or right of the word. But when I look at the image of the beast, we have, the, we have Antichrist, false prophet, an image of the beast. Do you think AI, the, the image of the beast, will be um, AI? I know it's speculation at this point, but J.B. Hickson brought up something very interesting with me in a video that we did. He thought there's a very real possibility that not only that, but you will have them all over the planet, these images of the beast, uh, with, with that AI technology. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, it's quite it's quite possible. I mean, there's no way to say for sure, but 
given where we are with the signs that Jesus and the prophets said to look for that we see already, and we see these technologies converging at this time, we would have to conclude there's a high probability that these technologies will play a role in the fulfillment of many of these end times prophecies. And I think, you know, we're already at the point where it's hard to tell reality from what's real and, and what's not. And that, I think that's why a lot of people are confused. I get a lot of questions from people saying, how do you know what news stories are right or what narratives mm -hmm. are part of a psyop versus what's what's real? And in a lot of a lot of cases, it's hard, hard to tell that now. And it sort of gets people second guessing themselves. And I think that's why it's so important to stay in the word of God. Make sure you're reading the Bible every day. Make sure you have your eyes fixed on Jesus because that is the truth. That's our anchor. And that's how we are able to navigate these times. Because as you said, it's all of this is going exp it's growing exponentially. It's only going to get worse. <laughs> to go back to John's illustration of Yankee Stadium, if we're sitting in the stadium, it's going to fill up very quickly, very rapidly in a short order of time. And I think most people are totally unaware of how quickly that's going to happen. And things are happening fast. When, when I think of the deception, it's so, it's so fascinating. You mentioned the news articles. Uh, how do you know what's real and what's not real? We hear about misinformation and disinformation so much. It's very hard to tell. There's fake websites fake news sites, uh, and then you throw in something like um, uh, something that, an event that took place in the past, and then you find out the government was actually behind it. And the whole thing takes place, everybody thought it was real, and the government had manipulated the whole thing, and X amount of people died or whatever. So you hear about that and you realize, well, wait a minute, that was, we were told a different story on that, and that makes you question every single thing that happens, even if it's real. You could have a hundred things that are all factual, but you're going to end up questioning every bit of information that you have. You know, how do you defend against that, Scott? Tom, this is important. You know that we, as a church, think through this and help you know each other, and that's why it's probably a, an appropriate moment to say that, you know, it's not likely that we're all going to uh, be able to really discern all the information sources from now on, let's say, because you're right, it's gonna increase. But I, I do think that one thing we must do, and we have to get over our hesitation to do this, is not to isolate ourselves and to do nothing but online news ingestion and research like that. We have to form relationships in our local church, even if they don't teach eschatology, even if they're off a little bit on whatever. But the overriding thing that we need is we need to be part of a community. And it could be a Bible study that you're part of. It could be meeting people for coffee somewhere. It could be something like that. But there has to be an anchor to the nonsense that we see in the news. And that is just being relational with each other to encourage, to help people connect the dots because plenty of us know enough to help teach, equip and uh, reveal, you know, the kind of the onion peeling part of being a watchman or watchwoman and how critical it is to help others understand the moments that we're in because everything matters at this point to Britt's point we do see the finish line and we are sprinting. We are sprinting with everything we have to be about the father's business right, right now with singular focus. And I just encourage everyone that's listening right now to let's, I, I think Jan Markell says it a lot, you know, that people write her all the time. I can't find a church. I can't find a church. That's why I think we're at the moment in, in our period right now where we have to overcome that issue and not you know, be afraid to engage again in small groups and churches, no matter uh, whether or not it scores perfectly on some kind of a checklist. 
I'm telling you, we need those relationships because if the things that Britt has warned about and regarding financial collapse, currency collapse, you know, uh, all of the things that he's so excellent at analyzing for us, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? You need another human being. Hey, do you have some food? I'm out. Can I trade you this for that? I mean, where are these relationships going to be? We have to make those investments right now. And if we as watchmen, because I'm guilty of kind of isolating myself and just you know, watching the news, you know, letting the fire hose, uh, you know, spick it full on, I think that is uh, increasingly going to be a problem. So I just warn us all as the church, as those, you know, that are awake and participating in this right now, that we need to help each other and we need our own source of strength through relationships now. I hope that didn't come across as too preachy, but we're not going to be able to completely defend or understand everything that's happening right now. I'm pretty sure of that. So we need real things in our life right now. And we should not delay in forming those relationships with neighbors and others. Yeah, absolutely. I look at relationships being so necessary. You need to know now who you can trust. John, I have several more questions I want to ask you guys. We don't have a lot of time left, but uh, can AI be used for good? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I don't know how they got my name, but I got a call from a, a, uh, church technology company who said, I hear you're interested in using AI in your church and we're developing that tool. So would you like that? So I'm going to go ahead and have a conference with them. And I don't remember what, I don't remember contacting them. Now they said, we're not going to help you make up a sermon or anything like that. We don't think that's right. Uh, but, you know, we'll help you generate discussion questions from your transcript of your sermon, you know, or help you get short videos put out uh, out of the, you know, two hour long things you put up all the time. Uh, <laughs> but um, so it, it's, it's coming. It's not um, in some respects, it's a tool that I think can be used, but you've got to, you've got to use discernment and the guidance of the Holy spirit. And of course the plumb line of scripture in what you're, what you're looking at. I mean, I look, I love the internet. Um, I can remember when I got my first cell phone 30 years ago this year or last year. And it it gave me, I used to stop at a payphone and hang out the window for two hours making phone calls at a truck stop, you know, because I had a case up in a you know an outlying county and I'd I'd have to make phone calls. But and so the cell phone gave me part of my life back, but it's been a pretty big trade-off because of what it's sort of taken away. And then when we have a thing like outages today, or like I had a week ago, it's like, how am I going to, how am I going to survive? Well, what, what happens when we, none, none of us have that. Be then that's when the community thing is going to become very, very important. How soon a uh, Brit could, we're, we're looking at things where we talked about a black swan event. Uh, I, I look at, you know, okay, when we were in Australia, the cameras, they're coming out with digital tracking ID. However, I look at the United States. I don't think it's going to be as easy to get these things through to the people. I understand create a catastrophic event. People will start wanting to have certain things developed like that. Um, just to have a bank account, just be able to go to the grocery store and so forth. But the infrastructure isn't, it's not in all the cities yet. It's not, I mean, there's a lot of cities here. Uh, the big cities probably have a lot more than the, the places out in the middle of nowhere. I live in an area where half the stuff out here never even works. I mean, I'm looking going, how, I mean, and I look at Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, I believe that Satan is behind the scenes manipulating his minions 
to build the system right now. I don't think I don't think Antichrist is going to be able to waste any time saying, okay, let's start working on this. Or as one of you commented very early on, we're not going to hit the three and a half year mark, and all of a sudden Antichrist and false prophet are going to get together and say, okay, let's uh let's start a GoFundMe account or whatever. You know, th- this thing has to be built. So I look and go, we could go through some very difficult times before this seven year tribulation period begins. Officially, that's my thought. And when I think of what Scott said, hey, we need to build those relationships now. And I don't want to, I mean, I, I might, I'm thinking I might be scaring some people right now, but I'm just trying to think practically through this. Ultimately, our hope is in Jesus. We are not to be people who live in fear, but we also have the Bible to warn us. Joseph prepared. He knew what was coming, so he told Pharaoh, hey, we got to prepare. But j- just give us some thoughts on this and some hope also, because I think I made everybody hopeless in the last one minute. Well, I think, it, it, you know, ultimately our hope is in Jesus Christ. I hope that everybody knows that's the most important thing that you can do. But I think what Scott and John were saying is dead on correct. I mean, community is extremely important. After your spiritual, emotional, mental health, those are the, those are the things you, know, you need to be right with Jesus. But if you're looking at any sort of catastrophic event, community is extremely important. And so the hope that people can draw out of that, because a lot of people have asked me, how do we prepare for these types of events? And one of the things that scares them is what? Well, I'm not a billionaire who can build some compound and store all this food and put all these provisions aside. You don't have to do that. You don't have to have a lot of financial resources, but you need to have community. When you look at things like the hyperinflation event in Zimbabwe 15 years ago. You can read books with personal accounts of people's stories. And the people that survived and thrived through that were not the people that had a bunch of gold and food stored up and a bunch of ammunition and they were all by themselves. Because again, you could have a fire. Let's say you have seven years of food, but the crisis lasts eight years, <laughs> you know, things like that. It's the people that had community and had relationships and would serve each other and could trust each other and look out for each other. And so that's that's the best thing you can do to prepare for any event that may come is to make sure you know your neighbors, you're building relationships with the people around you and building that sense of community. Because that's that and Jesus are ultimately what are going to see you through that. And you can help a lot of people by bringing the scriptures to them and that peace that Jesus can give and only Jesus can give to other people. So there's many ways to serve. You know, you don't have to be the strongest. You don't have to be the wealthiest, but look for what talents God's given you and how you can use those to help other people and attract a community around yourself. That's how, that's how I would prepare, how we're preparing, because we just don't know what, things we're going to have to endure. And again, a lot of people for years have told me all we'll be gone before these things happen. But look at all the Christians throughout history and in the modern times that have had to endure great trials and tribulations. Jesus said, we're going to have to do that, but take heart of overcome the world. So focus on Jesus first, build a community around yourself. That's a Best way I would say to prepare. Mm-hmm. Uh, one absolutely. Elders, yeah, one of our elders once yeah. said, "Don't don't worry about the devil. The worst he can do is kill you, and in that you win. So, uh, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That fear God, not not the devil." Amen. So, I, I think of the words of Revelation chapter twelve. The over came him, that'd be the evil one, Antichrist, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death, which is really what you said in a nutshell is, that's it, it's you fear the Lord. As we look at things developing, we're going to hear more about digital currency. We're, when everything ramps up in Australia, uh, which it appears is going to be this year, um, we look at blockchain technology. 
And right now we have the typical di digital currencies like Bitcoin and so forth. But as things develop, what what is the difference uh, between the digital currency like Bitcoin and what they are talking about and why does that make a difference? Central Central bank digital currency versus something like Bitcoin, Scott? Well, uh, first of all, it has to do with the centrality principle. So uh, Bitcoin is decentralized. In fact, most crypto that you would commonly think of, including Ethereum, Solana, I mean, XRP, you can go down the list. Any uh, coin market cap, for example, would show you what all those investment vehicles are. But what they are is decentralized for the most part. Central bank digital currencies are centralized by one issuing authority that is controlled. So in Bitcoin's case, it was specifically architected to be decentralized. So no one person or institution or government could interfere with it, control it or command its total uh, resource. And that is not what uh, is coming. The coming paradigm is going to be central control, which is why if you really think about the trajectory of the mark, you know, in Revelation 13, and you begin working backwards on that to say, well, if we're going to go down and we're going to get rid of cash and we're going to get rid of all of these other uh, payment systems, such as crypto, decentralized crypto, what does that imply about the survivability of, you know, crypto like that? Will those things have to be declared illegal? Will they be hacked and defeated? Will they be disrupted to such a point? And I would, I would propose logically that it's very likely that there'll be continued data breach, data leaks, thefts, because what they want to do is have this narrative that there's no place safe to hide, right? Trust us, we're the ones that have the perfect ability to guarantee that these central digital dollars that we're going to issue in your wallet, we are the ones that guarantee that. The government, it's not this other entity that no one knows who the founders are of these. They're nameless people. They're personas, most of them. So the idea that decentralized crypto will be around forever is really against what I see the word of God you know, uh, talking about. It's going to be defeated, misdirected. It'll be taken down. It will be declared illegal, just like gold, own, owning gold back in the days of the depression was illegal. So there's going to be a way that will centralize everything. And that's the big difference. And that's why those that, that are uh, so focused on decentralized, you know, crypto like Bitcoin and Ethereum being the two largest of those, they desperately want that to be there because they know that it partially insulates them from centralized control. In fact, D Bitcoin and Ethereum and other assets like that have been described as digital gold. It's the new way of thinking of protecting your assets outside of a banking system. So those are the primary differences that we yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, John, your thoughts? Uh, I think it's uh, it's going to come fast. I, one thing we haven't really talked about that I've been thinking about while we're sitting here talking is the impact that all of this is having in the area of weapons and defense. And we see, you know, we, we see these sort of laboratories that are in the wars that are going on right now where these weapons are being used, actually used and refined on the fly. Uh, I, I don't think Ukraine's going to win the war. I just thought they don't have the people to do it, but they've been able to kind of hold Russia at bay with some of this new technology. But, you know, now Iran is pumping out massive numbers of drones and missiles for Russia. 
and that's kind of an interesting alliance. So I don't know if we want to get into the, the whole Middle East thing because we'll be here for a long time. But I think it I think it does play into the to the wars, rumors of wars, and things that we see coming in Ezekiel 38, 39. We can argue about when those happen, but they will happen and they may not quite unfold the way that we think that they they should have. Uh, Brent, let me ask you this. A um, couple of things. So talking with my friend David Tal, who's a major in the IDF, he said with all the technology that Israel has, they were they were uh, outsmarted with low technology. Uh, and that's how they were taking advantage of that uh, because of that. But with that, the things that John just said, I'm curious, You've talked about molecular manufacturing, even on the battlefield, and how that is going to play a much bigger factor. Uh, it already is starting, but you said it's going to become much bigger. What is it, and what do you see coming of that? Well, in, in short, it's building from the bottom up. So we were talking earlier about technology sort of hitting limits on how far we can build down. But... Manufacturing at the atomic level, at the molecular level, positioning molecules in the exact precise place where they would react and bond together, where those, bond, those chemical bonds would break or form, and having computer control over that, and that would essentially give us computer control over matter. And to think of the, the power that this would unleash, think of, you know, a... a a goose flapping its wings and how many flaps it can do in a, in a minute. And then think as you get smaller, a blue jay, how fast a blue jay could flap its wings and then a hummingbird and then small insects. As we go down to that atomic level, we would see uh, things happening at a much faster pace. So we would see production, manufacturing production grow possibly a thousand fold, and you could create very inexpensive products, similar to what Scott was talking about of this uh, abundance that is coming in the near future, massive abundance, massive wealth. So when we talk about what's going on in Ukraine right now, we have conventional militaries completely being dominated by drones, drones in the air, drones on the ground, and these are drones that are really in the rudimentary, early, crude stages of development. We have yet to see very sophisticated drone swarms. I know they've had certain drone swarms on the battlefield there where they have what they call a queen that sits high atop the area of operation and, and it sends signals to the smaller drones below. But if you take out that centralized target, all of the drones become worthless. What we're going to see is we're going to see onboarding on these cheap, inexpensive drones that act as munitions, meaning they can blow up, they can surveil the battlefield, they can explode. They're going to be controlled by AI. They're going to be decentralized, meaning if you take out one or more, the others will continue to operate. They're going to learn on the battlefield, and they're going to even more so dominate the battlefield. So when we see molecular manufacturing come about, you would be able to create not just hundreds of these drones in a swarm, but thousands, billions, trillions. And so imagine what locusts do to a field of crops. And imagine a military that could control mechanized locusts and what they could come do on the battlefield and conventional weapons don't stand a chance. And I think this is not just in the air, but it's on land, it's in the sea. So we would see mutual assured destruction is going to become obsolete in the very near future because I believe the only thing keeping it in place right now is I, I don't know where that su nuclear powered submarine is right now. But once you have these types of technologies and the ability to deploy 
just billions of drones into the oceans, you could light up the oceans, you would be able to know where all of those things were. So, you know, Al Albert Einstein's attributed with saying, I don't know what weapons World War III will be fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. And I think that's the conventional wisdom the world holds, that there won't be another global war because it would lead to the end of the human race. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible says in Revelation 6, there will be war and slaughter everywhere. There will be another global war. And in the aftermath of that, we'll have a global empire and there will be material abundance within that. And so that that's where we're seeing all of this go right now. I think molecular manufacturing is technology that most people aren't talking about because it, unlike AI and quantum computing, where we can see the beginning stages of that, once that is unleashed on the world, it will be used to conquer the world. Mm. And so I think unless these end times events are fulfilled before we get to that point where that reaches critical mass, it will play, it, it will be the fulfillment of that portion of Bible prophecy and the establishment of that global empire. When, uh, it does seem like I, there's I think, a huge converge. It seems yeah. like there's a huge convergence of just so many things. Yeah, happening me, all at the I'm, same time. I'm going to get since uh, we've been two hours. I'm going to give everybody two minutes. John, I'm going to let you have the closing word because it's your channel. But with that, uh, just a couple of comments. These will be my closing words right now, right? Uh, Britt, you talk about conquering. That's Revelation chapter six. Verses 1 and 2, this white horse goes about conquering and to conquer. I mean, you can see it just with technology alone. Um, and it, you know, we can go further into that another time, another day. You, I also couldn't help but think Revelation chapter 13, or chapter 12, or no, chapter 13, excuse me, where nobody will be able to make war against the beast, which is what you just described. And with everything, nobody will be able to escape this thing that's coming but we have the hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Scott, I'm going to start with you, and then Britt, and then I'm turning it over to you, John. Uh, Scott, two minutes. Your, what do you want to share with everybody? And don't forget the hope we have in Christ, because everybody needs that. Thank you, Tom. I have uh, a stress reaction right now. That's why I'm coughing because the things that we've talked about on this episode are very sobering. And uh, the council of, you know, the reason why we do this is to help equip the body. And for those that are watchmen and watchwomen specifically to help share updated information as we see it. And to be able to have those hallway and water cooler type moments when you're working or at the grocery store in, in a line you have an opportunity to be there for people. And this is the time when we're on the final stretch and we're all sprinting. Every opportunity where the Holy Spirit is prompting us to you know, potentially get out of our comfort zone and engage somebody to have a conversation, to see something intentionally that might lead to uh, an ability to make a comment that would intrigue somebody that can hopefully blossom and bloom into uh, talking more about uh, the Lord, talking about the times that we're in. And I think that we're going to see more and more opportunities of this coming up. So uh, I think that that is what we should be focused on, being about the Father's work every day. And if our audience is not reading the Word of God every day, you know, I think that should be challenged right now. Our source of authority is the Bible, not YouTube, right? So we need to be cautious on the proportion of how we invest our time and really begin to zero in on the, the foundations of our faith. And that's where I'll leave it. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, Britt. Yeah, I think what the things that we talked about today and the things that we look at in the news on a regular basis, it can make a lot of people uncomfortable, even fearful. The reason we do this Book of Revelation tells us that the purpose of prophecy, the essence of prophecy, is to give a clear witness for Jesus Christ. So just as Scott said, we should be sharing that with people. Our eyes should be fixed not on 
all of these events and how terrible they are, but they should be fixed on Jesus Christ. And we should be rejoicing that we're getting closer and closer to his return, taking advantage of this time to share our personal testimony, our personal witness to as many people as we can about the peace that we have in Jesus Christ. Because again, these events are an opportunity where a lot of people will be unsettled. They'll be knocked out of their comfort zone. And a lot of people may see the peace you have and ask about how you have that peace. It's going to be a great time to share the gospel and to tell people how they can have peace throughout all of this, that Jesus gives a peace that the world cannot give. And so we need to be explaining to people about sin, that we were all born sinners, and what Jesus did in going to the cross, shedding his blood, he died on the cross, he was resurrected, he lives again, he's preparing a place for us right now, and he's coming back in victory. That's what all of this stuff means right now. It's, it's telling us we're getting near that time when Jesus comes back, and that will be a glorious day. Amen. Uh, uh, before I turn it over to you, John, I want to say this. Scott, thank you for joining us. Britt, thank you for joining us. John, thank you for allowing me to be here with you and to ask questions. And uh, it's really a privilege to be with three great minds. And I uh, appreciate all of you as friends and as brothers. John, again, thank you. It's your channel. Uh, take it away. Well, I'm going to say a few things, and then I'm going to ask uh, Scott to close us in prayer, and then we'll sign off. But I want to thank everybody for watching tonight. But, you know, I think back to um, I grew up in a house. Uh, my dad loved Bible prophecy. He talked about it. He preached about it. He had books about it. He watched what was going on. and 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 so there is this role that people certain people will be watchmen and you you have an obligation when you see something you need to tell people and then it's on them and i have to tell you i talk a lot and we talked tonight about some very heavy topics i really don't i really don't feel fearful okay maybe it's just because i'm old anyway um i'm not a young guy like brit but uh I, I think back to the passage where Jesus was talking to his disciples about his first coming, and he said, the prophets long to live when you're living. And I think we need to take that lesson, that teaching, and apply it to ourselves. We should be blessed, consider ourselves blessed that we're able to live at this time where we have the ability to bring people like four of us from all over the country and speak to people all over the world uh, with the technology. But, you know, there's a dark side to that, but we should consider ourselves blessed because we're seeing these things getting ready to be fulfilled because they point to the coming of Jesus, the Messiah to rule and reign. And so that's great hope. And, I I really don't have a spirit of fear. I'm concerned, but God has us. He says that in his words. Scott, could you close us out in prayer? Sure can. Father, thank you so much for this, uh, this opportunity to speak, to share with the body of Christ. For those that are uh, listening right now, I just... Uh, give a word of encouragement, Lord, we are coming to you in various levels of understanding, various levels of, uh, you know, understanding exactly all the technology and all the things that are moving on. But what we do want you to know, Lord, is that we love you. We are bending our knee right now in service to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we are basically saying, uh, Lord, that we are willing to follow your direction Help us to be grounded in your word. Make the, the word of God, your word, Lord, alive to us. If we feel dry, uh, Lord, please give us the water of life. Just, just nurture us, Lord, in our faith right now. Help us to build relationships with people for we may need that. And our influence needs to grow, not shrink. We should not be recoiling 
We should not be stumbling just as we see the finish line. Lord, help us to prevail. And Lord, personally, very personally, you know, I always come to you and we come to you now. Help us to have a beautiful experience with you at the Bema seat, knowing that we have done as you have commanded. We have obeyed. We have prevailed. How many times have you told us in scripture to prevail and to overcome? And we want to be counted among those, Lord. So we are making a commitment, a confession of purpose, of faith, of intention that we're going to follow and do the best that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, everybody, thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. I put links in the show description to everybody's websites, social media, and that type of thing. We really appreciate it. We hope to do more of these uh, with a, a you know a group of three or four. And I know I've got a few coming up in the next couple of weeks. So just watch my social media. I'll, I'll tell you about that. And so thanks so much. God bless and good night.